Okay, thank you, everyone. Um, after this uh, coffee break, uh, we have our second round table discussion. In this opportunity, the title for this second round table is the National Security Challenge to Trade and Investment Law. This panel, we have wonderful group of professionals, practitioners, and academics experts on this topic. We have Kathleen Clausen, Professor of Law at Georgetown University Law Center. We have Lothar Hearing, Senior Expert, uh, Directorate General for Trade at the European Commission. We have Henry Gao, Professor of Law at Jungpung House School of Law, Singapore. And then we have Ricardo Ramirez Hernandez, Professor of International Trade Law at the Mexican National University, UNAM. And of course, for this wonderful panel, we have Meredith, Meredith Lewis as moderator, who is Professor and Vice Dean at the University of Buffalo. So the floor is all yours. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. I'll just add to the um, introductions of our panel that Ricardo was a member of the appellate body for eight years, for those who don't know. So um, very glad to have his insights on the disputes, uh, if he's willing to give them. But um, the way we're going to proceed with our panel is a bit similar to the last, but also hopefully we'll mix it up a little bit and leave, um, if we're able to leave room for some questions from the audience, because I'm sure people would like to participate. So the mic is on, is that better? Okay, sorry about that. So I'm going to um, start off and just introduce our topic a little bit, and then I'm going to pose a question, some questions to our panelists. I'm going to encourage our panelists to respond to each other's comments as well if they'd like to. Um, but then the goal is going to be both to leave some time at the end for you to ask questions and to get us out of here for lunch on time, because that's the most important thing when you have the panel before lunch. So we have quite a broad topic, the National Security Challenge in Trade and Investment Law. And the first thing that comes to mind is, was well, national security even the right title for our panel? Uh, or how does that interface with the language that's used in the WTO, for example, which doesn't say national security, it says essential security interests or refers to security. Are those the same things or are those different? Of course, for many, many, many years, we had no jurisprudence about the security exceptions, right? But in the past several years, we now have a number of reports which have resulted in, in some ways, slightly divergent interpretations. Um, and raise a lot of interesting questions. So where I want to start with the panel is um, not doing a deep technical dive into the disputes, um, but to just ask some questions that will uh, have us reflect on the impact of now having some reports, having had panels decide that yes, um, these issues are at least to some degree justiciable uh, and, and their interpretations um, thus far. So I'm going to throw out just some thought bubble types of questions and ask each of our panelists to respond with, with their thoughts. And those who want to uh, get into the interpretations themselves, that's great. Those who want to look at this from a uh, more bird's eye view level of the implications, um, that's, that's fine as well. So the types of things that I thought perhaps could come up in this um, first round, and, and my comments are not surprises to the panel as when I say that I'm thinking of, um, would be what, what critiques do you have of the jurisprudence so far? Um, flashing back to my initial comment, should we be thinking of essential security interests as akin to national security, or does it mean something else? We've seen uh, the US in particular invoking Article 21 in contexts that perhaps don't align with national security or a military kind of context, but what, what is intended? What should be um, that interpretation? What 
now that we have this jurisprudence, do we feel better or do we feel worse? Is it, is it destabilizing in a way to have reports that the US and Russia object to as, as a matter of principle, that, that these were adjudicated at all? What, is, what, are, what are the implications of that? Um, and then I wanted to uh, also throw out there the, the US's recent response to, to the most recent reports in the uh, dispute, the uh, DSB meeting last week, um, sort of complaining about China wanting to have national security be examined uh, in WTO disputes and the US's view that the proper remedy in such cases would be to just to bring a non-violation or nullification and impairment complaint um, rather than the types of uh, uh, cases we've seen thus far. So with that in mind, I'm going to turn it over to my panelists. We're gonna go from Lothar uh, to my right. Um, and I know that everyone is uh, good on keeping to time, but if need be, I'll step in, but I'm just gonna let you go until I need to encourage you not to. Lothar says he wants five minutes. You can have five minutes, all good. <clears throat> Thank you very much. <clears throat> I'm happy to be here with all of you to confer, um, to share some insights, reflect together with you and learn jointly uh, with you. I will do that drawing from my work, but in my personal capacity. So Meredith already said in the introduction that one of the quite a few things that have changed in the last years is that we now have some dispute settlement practice, some adjudicative rulings, uh, namely four to be precise, on the security exception of the GATT article 21. Uh, but in fact, this is very little nevertheless, because all these four panel reports dealt only with uh, one of the uh, exceptions, namely Article 21b, subparagraph 3, the war or other emergency in international relations uh, threshold. What qualifies as that? That is the question which the four panels have had to answer, and they um, gave slightly different answers to this. Um, apart from that, uh, only some of them dealt a little bit, and also this, in, in coherently comparing the, the various reports who spoke on this, um, the chapeau requirement of Article 21b, um, what is required and what can be reviewed by WTO panel regarding the action being one which the member invoking Article 21 can consider as being necessary for the protection of its essential security interests. So the essential security interests, which is of course the subject close to the title of this uh, round table. Um, so we have learned a little bit um, but many questions are still open. Inter alia, what is exactly the threshold? How bad does an international relation between two countries' members have to be in order to qualify as an emergency, other emergency than war in international uh, relations? Um, it's a high threshold that's clear by now, that's good, but how high exactly, that is not yet sorted out um, and also not uh, entirely consensual throughout the membership and the adjudicators. Um, on the question of whether the uh, chapeau requirement, uh, essential security interest, whether that is at all reviewable, we have a panel which almost said, but you know, 80%, Peter Vandenbosche half a year ago explained this very well at another academic event. So 80% of what this panel said indicates that this is not reviewable. And not reviewable means not at all reviewable. 20% of that panel report suggests that this is not decided by that panel. Um, and another panel report, uh, which was uh, copied by uh, another, the first two panel reports, the one on Russia transit and on the Saudi IP, uh, IP measures, 
held this to be partially reviewable with a plausibility uh, requirement or a good faith uh, test. Now, I will now tell you in few sentences why this latter approach is the only possibly correct one. This has to be reviewable. This has to be meaningful. It possibly has to be even a bit more than just a good faith and plausibility. And it's very easy to explain that to you. Um, and I can draw on practical examples, uh, which are right before us, on the other exception, which is the exception for weaponry and any other goods where the trade is carried out uh, in order to supply directly or indirectly a military establishment. So this is um, trade for supplying military forces. That is what members can restrict without limit, without non-discrimination, chapeau requirement at all times. This doesn't require a war crisis or whatever. And it's also quite logical. You're not obliged to supply your opponent with the best weapons which that opponent might want to buy in your um, market. Um, but this doesn't apply just to weapons. It applies to any goods if they are supplied directly or indirectly um, to the military. Indirectly was already recognized in the gut negotiating history that this covers production materials, machinery, which is used to produce things which then are integrated into yet other products which are purchased and used by the military. Um, that is the correct interpretation. Um, but that is also why it's so important to have a real essential security interest to um, invoke, because otherwise, you know, what, what, what doesn't the military uh, buy? Because I should first add maybe this uh, second thought, apart from this indirect trade towards the military, this also has to cover the potential trade to a foreign uh, military. Yeah, so it's not enough for the foreign purchaser to be non-military, for that exception to be non-invocable. Because maybe that foreign purchaser purchases it from you, it's a civilian purchaser, and then turns around and hands it over to the military of that country. Maybe even has to turn it over to the military of uh, that country. So what I'm talking about here is the dual use um, uh, area, yeah, which is a wide area. We have no ruling whatsoever on this exception in Article 21. It's usually important, was applied over the decade, always in the Cold War, it was called the CUCOM list. Um, and today we have all these different arrangements. But here's my point. Uh, we need the essential security interest in order to distinguish between uh, potatoes and the most advanced microchips with which you can make the best drones and rockets which make you win a war. Yeah? The latter is obviously a essential security interest you can invoke, but potatoes, which are also needed uh, by the military because they want to serve French fries in their canteen occasionally, that does not translate into a security uh, interest, and therefore you cannot restrict the exportation of all your potatoes to the other country with the argument that maybe some of those potatoes will be used in the canteens of the foreign military that you don't want to win a war. Um, second small uh, example, and this is very, very current um, and also not yet answered, not even analyzed anyway so far. Uh, what trade are you allowed to restrict under the emergency or war uh, exception? Uh, we have now in place a lot of uh, sanctions against Russia. Yeah? So obviously this covers goods bound to Russia and from Russia. But it also can it also cover uh, goods that are not of or Russian origin, but that are, that are made anywhere in the world with just some Russian input, you know, which could even be fossil fuel imported from Russia that was used in the production process. Again, I say I wouldn't want to exclude that but we need a security interest. Otherwise, there's no um, control and no um, threshold and no limit to what you can um, invoke or, tr or, or transit. Um, because 
uh, goods. Russia is a big territory, so it's a normal itinerary for many other uh, destinations. If you um, prevent transit through Russia, um, that means there are a lot of other countries which um, are collateral, um, collaterally damaged. And so again, uh, there needs to be a, a security um, interest. I should stop here. I will maybe later um, come to uh, some others, but maybe I can just add one more thought. And I don't want to be misunderstood. Um, from what I said, you can gather that I find it extremely good. It's even essential that we have these first findings under Article 21. Um, this is necessary for us to know better and see better day by day where are the limits between what Article 21 allows and what it does not allow. We had a very fuzzy idea uh, in the past about this and never needed to look at these things from close. Now uh, we have to. But I don't want to overlook that, uh, of course, uh, we know that not everybody is happy about uh, these rulings. And so the United States is uh, unhappy and thinks this should never have happened. And that instead, uh, non-violation should have been used uh, as, a, as a remedy. And maybe we can speak a bit about that a bit uh, later and also about where the US stands on all this. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Thank you, Professor. Um, uh, let, let me start, and, and I have to react to the potatoes example, uh, because I will say potatoes vis-a-vis -vis tortillas, but we will get, I will get to that. Uh, and, and let me start with a very bold uh, statement, and I am being in this very partial, very biased. In talking about these four reports, reading through them, this is precisely the problem of not having an appellate board. This is what happens when you have four panels going their way, giving their interpretation, without having even think about that there will be a check on them, on what they will say, because I think part of the problem of the four panels, and I'm saying part of the problem in the sense that the different interpretations that they, they, came, they came to was that either they didn't want to be bold because they thought there was not gonna be an appellate body that would maybe say, okay, I will correct them, or they were very restrained on trying only to solve the dispute. And at the end, I think that was a reaction. And that's what we are, when, we, when you read the full report, that's the conclusion you come about. This is the problem. This is the coherence problem. This is the holistical interpretation problem that we, we face when we don't have an, adjudic an adjudicative body that reviews, especially in these kinds of, of issues. And I will address some of them agreeing mostly in what um, Lothar said about it. Uh, the first of all, this essential security interest. The first two, 412 and 512 um, and 5667, went through that. Uh, they used the, the good faith tool. Not sure they may want to explore that, but then you read the other two. And they basically forget about that chapel and went to emergency and international relations issue. And what is the problem with that? First of all, you complain about the appellate body uh, uh, using dictionaries. Why don't you complain about panels using phrases and grammatical structures and expending paragraphs to say whether this is one sentence or where it's a holistic sentence? And how many pages were spent in all those four cases discussing that, which really, I mean, you complain about, and again, you complain about we using dictionaries. Uh, and the other issue is the problem with, it, and I will get to the chapeau, I think it, something needs to be, I mean, it, it's different, it's, it's difficult how you can grapple with the two most recent interpretations when they didn't engage and you are trying to guess what happens with the chapeau with them. But when you get into those, I wonder whether at the end, if this, um, they, if this interpretation they came up with actually restricts very, uh, puts very limited uh, strains on, on when you can use the, the exception at all. And basically what they are saying is, you cannot use it. You have to be in a time of war or something similar to use that. 
And I wonder whether that was the interpretation that you want. And, and, and this goes to this, again, all of them go to a very thorough discussion of Article 32 and the story of negotiations. But why didn't any of the four panels thought through about evolutionary interpretation? This was a provision that was, in, that was, that was agreed in 1947. Come on. And at the end, nobody discusses, no one of the four goes and said, thinks about it, okay, national security, essential security and interest, are they the same that I, we, we face now? And I, this ties to my potato and, and tortilla example. <laughs> I will say that for Mexico, corn is an essential security interest. That for Mexico is so important corn, so important, not only for dietary purposes, yes. but also for, for, for our, our roots as Mexican go, go through corn. So how can you not say, and, and I'm, I'm sure I'll have more uh, uh, okay, that, that corn is an essential security interest for Mexicans. And at the end, I don't think that the panels were thinking through and say, okay, this has to do, and again, this has to do with, they were trying to focus on the issue, they were trying to address the issue at all only, but I'm not sure that they were talking or thinking about evolutionary interpretation of terms, especially when you're dealing with such an important provision and you're dealing with a new world that was in 1947 and you could have thought other things and try, again, think about not only weapons and not only bullets, but, Tortillas. So. Thank you. Before I pass it to Henry, I just wanted to comment on um, Ricardo's point about <clears throat> uh, what, how much at war do you need to be in? What, what does that mean, right? That in the um, Hong Kong China uh, Marks of Origin report, it was quite striking the comment that well, essentially, if you're cooperating internationally on anything, you can't invoke Article 21. On the other hand, so that's one end of the extreme, right? On the other end of the extreme, the US somehow deeming there to be a crisis in international relations between the US and Canada, <laughs> warranting the Section 232 um, imposition of, of those duties, perhaps uh, the opposite end of the extreme. Pass on to Henry. So it's my pleasure to be in this panel. Uh, since uh, low time, uh, uh, Ricardo has done such an excellent job of uh, explaining and uh, dissecting the jurisprudence so far. So instead of a focus on the jurisprudence, I think I would focus on the different perspectives of uh, big countries like China and small countries like uh, Singapore on the uh, national security issue. And uh, uh, as someone who has uh, uh, spent the first 20 years of my life in China and uh, the last 20 years in Singapore, I feel that uh, I, I, I do have something to say about this issue. Now, first of all, on China, uh, as I will explain later when we discuss the national approaches, China actually is uh, one of those countries which has probably the most support uh, review on national security. Everything is national security in China these days. But in the WTO, you didn't really see uh, China litigating, uh, these cases on national security grounds, with the only exception of the pending uh, case concerning uh, China's restrictions on uh, goods from uh, this whole area. Uh, so that case has not, uh, um, there's no panel report out yet, so we don't know how China will argue the national security defense. But I think it's very interesting that um, the other case, which also concerns the national security with regard to China, that is the Marx of origin case concerning Hong Kong. Actually, ironically, it was the US doing the bidding for China in that case by saying after the panel report came out the US uh, TR spokesperson said, we will not say our judgment or decision making over security uh, matters to the WTO. So I can see that um, maybe later this year when China litigate the case concerning Lithuania, China, the Chinese delegation will be citing exactly the same phrase in the WTO. So the US has really done good homework for them. 
So uh, if you look at some of the previous cases, for example, uh, the famous uh, uh, publications and all the rural products case, in that case, I mean, if that case were litigated today, I would see the Chinese uh, delegation trying to invoke the national security exception. But at that time, China didn't invoke national security. Instead, China invoked the public moral exception uh, because China took a, a, a much uh, a lighter approach on national security uh, back then. But China has totally changed. Uh, so that is the uh, review about China, which hopefully I will uh, elaborate further to explain the rationale for this uh, when we go to the second round. Now, how about uh, the reviews of some smaller countries like Singapore? I understand um, uh, and agree uh, to many of the things like Ricardo and Lota said, there are many problems uh, with uh, uh, these four decisions. But for smaller countries like Singapore, it is always better to have a, a, an independent and impartial adjudicator to decide these cases, rather than having these big countries decide among themselves. Uh, the uh, late uh, uh, founding father of Singapore, uh, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, uh, used to say, when elephants fight, uh, the grass uh, suffers. But when elephants make love, the grass suffers also. So Singapore really see itself as the grass. And uh, it doesn't want this elephant to keep fighting or making love every day. Instead, it wants somebody to tell these elephants, stop fighting, OK? We want you to just live in peace with each other. So that is the perspective, I think, of many smaller countries, including Singapore, regardless of all these uh, problems with all these decisions, it is uh, much better that we have somebody in Geneva uh, to decide these issues rather than somebody in Washington or Beijing deciding these cases. So I'll stop here. Thank you. Thanks so much, Meredith. And thanks also to the organizing team for the generous invitation. Um, I'm going to open the aperture even more um, and borrow from a, a friend, uh, Harlan Cohen, who many of you know, uh, who said about a year ago that everyone seems to have gotten on the security train and no one seems to be getting off. And I think if we think about it in those terms, I'm never sure if, if that's because they don't know how to get off the train or if they actually think the national security train is getting them somewhere. So there are many different possible destinations, I think, for our national security train and, and many different tracks for, for getting to each of them. But one possible destination that I think worries a number of us, it frightens many in the room, is that the train goes totally off the rails and crashes and burns. And I have to think, I, if you all have seen the latest trailer for the new Mission Impossible, I think it's coming out soon. Have you seen the train? It's, it's, it goes, it, I think they actually made a train to, okay. Anyway, uh, apart from the special effects, which look great, that you know is that our international economic law train that's about to crash and burn i hope not and i won't ask who is the tom cruise of international economic law but okay leave that that's for the, the coffee or the drinks perhaps okay so so do we know where we're heading with this national security paradigm of sorts and and perhaps more importantly do we need a different track entirely from the exceptions and we put a lot of weight on them the exceptions, especially for the what the exceptions may not be able to anticipate in the future. So a number of you in this room, the, the collective brain trust is very strong, have been writing about, uh, about national security exceptions and how we might re-envision them. And I think we have thought more and we increasingly need to think more about how they can be reworked Right? Not, or maybe we don't rely on them as much, or maybe we think of rewriting the rules in ways that, that don't uh, necessitate our turning to exceptions. Uh, if we take, again, particularly in ways that we, we may be able to anticipate what we cannot anticipate now. Also, as I've been reflecting on the, the train metaphor, uh, I, I was reminded that about three years ago or so, maybe more now, we were talking about a different sort of metaphor uh, in, in, with greater salience, and that was the trade war. We talk about the trade war anymore so much now that could be for a variety of reasons we have other wars that are occupying our attention we have uh, other it, in some ways it's just been normalized right and by thinking about this as a train instead of a war we are maybe normalizing it to e even more um, but still our exceptions are there that we haven't fully normalized our story there is some disconnect still between the exceptions in our in the law and the discourse that we have and, but we also also know that there's always been security as a justification for our trade policy. Let's just take the US practice, for example. We did not negotiate a trade agreement with Oman in the early 2000s 
for economic, out of economic considerations, right? That integration with Oman was not at the top of the list in economic terms at that time. So, so security has always been a driving force and maybe now it's just taking on new manifestations. And with these new manifestations, again, I think we're starting to see thinking from this room and from beyond about a non-exceptional space and we should do more of that. That narrative is now starting to shift with it, the norms uh, are accompanying them. So I think it's important to have that conversation now, the non-exception place of security in international economic law, to have that sooner rather than later for reasons that Ricardo uh, hinted at, uh, what may be on the horizon on FTA disputes, for example, and in the interest of the train overall, because I don't think that's a mission impossible. Great, thank you so much. And hope you keep that microphone, Kathy, because we'll start with you in the next round. So um, everyone did a great job of keeping to time. And if we stick to about five minutes each on this one, we'll have 15 or 20 minutes for, for questions. Um, so what, we're, what I'd like us to do now is to um, both go broader and narrower. And the broader is there, there have been various, I guess, um, goings on that would suggest that the um, interpretation of what essential security interests is or what might be in the national security has become quite a bit broader and could become broader still, right? So is climate change an, a, an essential security interest? Is um, our human rights, which the U.S. invoked recently, saying that the U.S. will take actions in its essential security interests, including protecting human rights um, outside the country, <laughs> uh, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I'd like each of our panelists, since we have such great uh, representation um, geographically, to talk a little bit about what's going on in um, the US, in, in China slash East Asia, uh, Mexico, and in Europe, um, with respect to these swirling developments and changes in, in um, understanding of, of what security or essential security might mean. Um, is it broad? Is it narrow? Should the WTO be dealing with it or not? Whichever direction you want to take that in and start with Kathleen and move this way. Great, thanks. So, so I'll, um, I'll talk about U.S. Uh, conversations in this space um, in a sort of a three-part story. First, I'll do some highlights of the inventory of uh, security uh, tools and initiatives, um, plus a few takeaways from that inventory. Um, then I want to talk a little bit about the forces at work and then come back to your point, Meredith, that so much now falls under the security uh, umbrella. So inventory, well, we could be here all day if we went through all of the different initiatives that could fall under uh, the international economic law um, space for the US uh, activities. But let me just start with a few. Um, so export controls and sanctions are no doubt at the top of the list, particularly as they relate to, to China and Russia. Again, this, this audience knows that well, although I do think it's worth sort of separating those out, right? Because the motivations differ when you look at export controls for, for China, export controls for Russia, again, sanctions for China, sanctions for, for Russia, discussions about, about them. Um, if, when you do that, you start to see, for example, right, the Russia focus, it's that there's a set of moves to, to ban goods and services from getting in and out. There's a, a set of moves to make it more expensive for Russia to do business. There's a set of moves designed to reroute resources. right? And so those can be totally different when we, when we turn to other parts of the world and other actors. Um, and so sometimes that disaggregation, I think, gets lost and, and worth doing. But that's, those are sort of our most traditional, right? The most sort of obvious things we could start with. We would add also, again, of course, tariffs now, now normalized, uh, but economic coercion bills moving through Congress of different sorts, talking about more possible tariffs on, on the way. Uh, we could talk about things that are sort of maybe less traditional, but should surely be a part of this conversation, banning China telecom, Right. Um, the conditions in the CHIPS Act, IRA, and the Inflation Reduction Act, we talked about this morning somewhat in, in the industrial policy uh, space. Law enforcement initiatives, right? We should be talking about the criminal actions that are taking. We should be talking about the Security and Exchange uh, Commission, um, ICTS supply chain uh, executive order. The list goes on. Now, I haven't even said anything about, um, of course, CFIUS and the outbound investment mechanism, which uh, there may be another panel that's going to delve into that more deeply. Um, but I, for a moment, just to pause on the outbound um, investment screening mechanism, which uh, we're all waiting for with bated breath. Uh, this is an important uh, milestone, so to speak, if, if it actually comes to pass. We thought it was going to come about a year ago, right? And now there's been a lot of shopping that's happening, as I understand it, um, both with the trading partners as well as with uh, the private sector and, and others, but it's, it's because it's coming really from scratch, 
right? I mean, yes, we have CFIUS, we have the inbound screening mechanism, uh, uh, but this one is, is really a, a new way of thinking, a new shift, a shift in thinking uh, on the part of policymakers um, saying, we don't want that here, right? And that applying that in this new tool, I think is a big step. Why are we trying to do that? It has occupied also a lot of time in the design of this tool. Are we doing it because we believe in human rights and we care about human rights uh, problems uh, abroad? Are we doing it for a supply chain? Are we doing it because of tech protection? And I don't think all of those narratives are sort of coalescing, um, but that also I think has impeded the development of the, the tool. So we could go on for the, the inventory. I won't, I won't belabor the point. You all know most of what I've said already, um, but just a, a couple of takeaways on that. Um, first is, I think you can see across these, the current landscape, um, a greater emphasis on the place of the firm, the place of the corporation uh, in this story. So we, yes, we care about, uh, Isabel said earlier today, right, the, the clubs, we sure we have the clubs, we got the partnerships, we got the talking that's happening. Uh, but now we're also looking at what we can do in a sort of trade policing way. Right? What is it we can do to use firms as actors in the story, um, to use them for their intel, to use them for their deep pockets, to influence their movements. Not new, but a greater emphasis, I think, on what we're, we're seeing there. A, a DOJ official uh, said not long ago um, that we used to divide the world into private space and government space. And now we have new targets because the objectives of our adversaries are economic advantage. So that has required us to change our regulatory regime and look more uh, at the intersections between those spaces. A second takeaway, I think, from the inventory is, is just how experimental it is. And I mentioned that there are tools in the works, there are tools, it's a lot just like throwing things against the wall, uh, I think, very much, and trying to see what sticks. Um, not all the, the programs are singing the same tune. And as I mentioned, different motivations leading us to, to apply different tools in different ways and, um, and to see which among the, the mostly sticks, not carrots approach, is sticking. And the third takeaway, I think, is this uh, obsession with more tools. Right. Not new, again, but again, for the last, uh, certainly for this administration, the constant demand for having more tools. What can we give the executive to use? Doing a matrix of the tools. What's missing? How can we do more? And so on and so forth. Already in 2016, that talk was there, but I think it's, it's intensified. Two last points then, Meredith, are um, firstly, uh, I mentioned I wanted to talk about the sort of forces at work. Um, here, I would use another metaphor as my theme of the day, uh, which is a full court press. It's a basketball metaphor. Um, and what it means is everyone on the basketball court is putting pressure where they can. And I think that is a particular noteworthy point of this moment. We're talking in the US, we're talking about agencies, Congress, the courts. Right? It's not just USTR and commerce who are doing this or, or treasury. Right? And now it's the State Department, it's the NSC, it's customs, it's bipartisan. Uh, I mentioned the bills in Congress. So, so and there are, with that, there are, are not insignificant sort of bureaucracy issues, right? A, a lot of uh, cooks in the kitchen uh, and where coordination is very hard, right? It's hard to accommodate these changes uh, and, and who directs these tools has multiple implications that, that we can discuss more if time permits. Finally, um, the, the third category of topic, uh, the intersections with other themes. And I think Vera put this in very clear terms for us this morning, just how much our critical minerals uh, initiatives have an impact on our uh, sustainability initiatives and, and so on and so forth. And so I think where we should spend more time now is with where our security plans, goals, discourse, uh, intersects with our sustainability initiatives discourse. And those are, I think, front of mind for the Biden administration. Those two uh, very, in some ways, difficult to reconcile areas of policy, but both increasingly important. Um, they're, they're difficult to reconcile because firstly, they require and demand a great deal of heterogeneity, where there's a heter heterogeneity of threats, but also requires a heterogeneity of approaches. And those sometimes conflict with one another. Vera made that, that point. Um, it means, moving away from reciprocity toward more attempts at cooperation, but not always successful. And I think for us as uh, academics, most of us in the room, not all, uh, that also requires some more interdisciplinarity and maybe some granularity uh, on how we think about this, right, in practice. Right? We, we can't all sort of think in our own spaces about this uh, individual work, but we need to talk more with our environmental friends, our security, military friends, and so on and forth, so forth uh, in the study and application uh, of these topics. Okay, so I will focus on China. First of all, uh, I'm trying to follow the example set by Mark. You know, I want to ask you this question. Do you know who is in charge of national security policy in China? Anybody in the room? Well, I see only knobs. Oh, 
Okay, Mark. Mark knows, of course, Mark knows everything. Uh, but um, actually, I think the rest of the um, um, audience in the room are too shy to, to raise your hand because this is a person that you definitely know. The person is President Xi Jinping. He's the guy who's in charge of national security, right? So, uh, but you didn't know he's in charge of that, so you are afraid to raise your hand. So, as I mentioned, um, China's view on national security has uh, undergone a sea change in recent years. And the date was April 15th, 2014, when President Xi uh, at the first general meeting of the newly formed National Commission uh, launched this uh, concept of so-called holistic review of national security. And uh, by the way, um, I should mention that um, after that fateful meeting, China decided to make uh, April 15th the National Security Education Day. And guess what? Uh, that is also my birthday. So I feel very safe, very secure whenever I celebrate my birthday because of that. So what does this holistic review of national security uh, entails? It covers uh, a total of 20 different fields. And uh, in case I forget any, so I'm reading from my phone here. These include political security, military security, homeland security, economic security, and financial security, which by the way, uh, you know, as uh, Kathleen referred to, uh, the latest Mission Impossible case, actually, if I understand correctly, um, and the uh, Mason Hunt, actually in that case, uh, he was supposed to be working for the IMF, right? So that could be under uh, national security, under uh, China's concept of national security. And then cultural security, public security, science and technology security, cyber security, food security, ecological security, resource security, nuclear security, overseas interest security, and some emerging fields like uh, outer space security, deep sea security, polar security, biosecurity, artificial intelligence security, and data security. I finally finished this. So uh, every time I celebrate my birthday, I would just recite the 20 fields of national security uh, in order to, you know, um, excise my lungs, right? So that's a nice way of exercising. So uh, you can see that uh, this new review of uh, uh, national security really reflected in China, how China conducting its economic policy. For example, a lot of you probably heard of uh, uh, these recent crackdowns in the tax se sector against the major companies such as Didi, which is the largest ride hitting app in China, and also Alibaba, the largest e-commerce player in the world. Why were they uh, uh, cracking down on these homegrown digital giants? Uh, DDE, for example, because there was an episode, uh, an incident whereby some uh, analysts basically had nothing better to do, decided to uh, uh, look at uh, the uh, right hitting record of this uh, uh, ministerial compound of the uh, main economic ministries of China to see when uh, the uh, bureaucrats would be getting off. Okay, so you will see a spike of uh, cars. Uh, from that ministry, and then we can decide when China would be introducing major policies. So that is uh, a, a very interesting way of uh, getting some clue about China's economic policy change. And in the case of Alibaba, that is because Alibaba got too big, and especially they started providing uh, some sort of banking services, and this is regarded as the so-called in President Xi's words. Uh, the barbaric groups of the capital, uh, which uh, basically made it hard uh, for the uh, you know uh, government to remain in control. So uh, quickly, let me move on to how this is reflected also in China's uh, trade policy. You see, China in recent years uh, start to introduce all these new trade regulations, such as a blocking statute, which is copied from the EU, the non-reliable entity list, which is copied from the US, the export control law, anti-sanction law, which are also copied from the US. So uh, you see, basically, national security started to be uh, used everywhere. And uh, uh, here, I, I will conclude by saying that, um, well, China, of course, uh, has to share the blame, but China is not the only one to blame, because look at all these laws. Who did China learn from? The US and EU. So um, I guess if the US continue to have this expansion of national security, then uh, you will not be surprised if China would follow suit. Thank you. Yes. Uh, let, let me let me 
go first back to some of the things mentioned by, by Catherine and, and also by, by Henry, because at the end, I do agree that we may want to shy away from 21 and maybe leave 21 and maybe leave corn from 21 and leave only bullets and firearms for 21. But the problem and listening to you is how can you deal with these problems if you don't have disciplines for national security in general, for sustainability, for everything that you have just mentioned, <laughs> how can you deal with that without that? And that is the problem. We are here least discussing this 21 and, and other issues because of the problem that member, the membership has not been able to agree on rules. And we have expanded uh, interpretations on this because members have not agreed on rules. And the problem is that sooner or later, with or without 21, you will have to address this issue. And you will have to have a discussion, where are the limits of this? How can you go past this? And this ties to the rules. How can you have subsidy rules as you have now, when you have uh, policies like that you want on the other side? How can you reconcile the rules that you have with what is happening in Europe, in the United States, in China. And maybe I can give you the bluntest example of, of what, how can you take streams of national security with example of Mexico. The Mexican president issued a decree saying every, every important, every, every project of, uh, of, of importance for the government is a matter of public interest and national security. Therefore, they will not share any information. And also it was used as an excuse uh, to have government procurements, uh, just uh, adjudication direct, bidding direct without going on a public bidding. And of course the, the Supreme Court came back and said, hold, hold, hold on, hold on, hold on. You cannot just bluntly say one project, the Mayan project going uh, from all uh, Riviera Maya would not be just just for the sake of saying, could be a, a, a national security. But discussions like this will start to come up. And at the end, there will be policies like this starting to come up, not only to protect and maybe for sake of transparency or for, or for sake of public uh, procurement, but also it's, also it is to pursue a public purpose, a public policy. This is a decree where the president says, these are the projects that are my priority for this government. And you're talking about a refinery. You're talking about very polluted. Uh, you, talk, uh, you talk about a, a train. You're not talking about electric vehicles. You're talking about simple policies that they want to pursue under the purview of national security. And this is what we have come up with. And this is the problem with that. And if you cannot discipline them, or you have at least Supreme Courts that will say, no, hold on, you cannot say everything is national security. You have to, and, and even the court went further and said, no, 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 national security, you, you tell me which project exactly, concretely, and what is the national security that you are pursuing in this project? I think that the, the Supreme Court was very good in, 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 in signaling that. But at the end, I think it's, a, it's, a, it's an example, an illustration of what is happening and what is happening all over the world. And what is happening when you start discussing discipline something. And the question is whether you don't need to fix only dispute settlement, you don't need to fix only national security, you need to fix the whole package, in my view, in order for these policies to accommodate them and to have some limit and discipline so they don't become uh, obstacles to trade or you, you don't run into national treatment and, and most favoring nations problems on trade disciplines. But at the end, this is an example of what is happening. And what, the way I see it is it's, it's, uh, it's like a decision. Kathleen and Henry in particular have provided very long lists of what can be related to security. I don't have to add anything to that, but I want to highlight that these are not the same as speaking about essential security interests under the security exception. The term security, the noun security can be combined with 
virtually uh, everything under the sun, even more so in uh, other languages, French and Spanish, as far as I know, don't have the distinction between safety and security. Both is security and non WTO languages, uh, many similarly. Um, what is security? Security is the prevention of harm, uh, protection against harm yeah? in, in traffic, malnutrition, disease, a crime. Uh, that is a totally normal role of government. That's what a government has to provide for, for its citizens. This is even in the fields that are protected by human rights, an obligation, an international obligation on uh, states uh, to perform. But that is not the same as saying that all these things are relevant under the WTO security exceptions. Many of the policies needed to protect against these risks uh, don't require departures from WTO basic obligations. Where they do, we have other exceptions that are relevant and applicable uh, to uh, those things. Whereas the security exceptions uh, to most of these things don't apply. Um, not just not to corn, because, you know, Ricardo, if Mexico says corn, then France says cinema, um, together with Canada, culture, and uh, everybody will have their main interest. Um, but under Article 21, um, it's actually very easy, because it has to be nuclear um, supply to the military, or war or emergency. And, um, you know, even if you don't care about what is an essential security interest, most of these things will simply fall um, outside. This does not mean that, uh, so I don't want to sound like saying the opposite of what you noticed said, that the security uh, exception has to, has seen, seems to have become uh, broader. I don't think that's true either. Um, rather it has become narrower, but not by having been made narrower, yeah, heaven forbid, that's not the role of uh, adjudicators. No, it's because we are looking more closely about what are actually the requirements. And we realize, well, there are words, words there, and each of these requirements has to be met for that uh, exception to be um, invocable. Um, and and, and there, thereby we learn a lot, and uh, we probably in the past had uh, misconceptions about what can fall under this. Human rights uh, was mentioned. So the, the, the bandwagon on which many people jumped is also the excitement after the first panel ruling in 2019 on the Article 21 that uh, scholars, yeah, so including people here in the room or people like us, thought, oh, that's exciting. And now I will write a piece uh, applying this to the COVID pandemic and to climate change. Uh, of course, that's an emergency. It's just not an emergency in international relations. And so far, at least, uh, fortunately, um, and in any event, it is not one uh, that relates to nuclear or, or weaponry. Um, and, and there are other exceptions. And um, sometimes there are no exceptions in the WTO uh, for uh, protecting something. And that's something we learned elsewhere. Gabriel Marceau is, I think, supposed to be here, but I haven't seen uh, to her, uh, seen her yet. Uh, she could explain that. Um, the um, panel report in DS543, very easy number to remember, the US tariffs case, Section 301 against China, a case brought by China. That is a case which te teaches you why Article 20, public morality, cannot be invoked for human rights sanctions. The justification for these things, we have to realize, and many of us will still realize, has to be found outside the um, WTO agreement. And so the answer uh, to your question, Catherine, of who is the Tom Cruise, uh, is actually a very good news answer, because it is people like everyone here in the room and outside this room, uh, adjudicators, scholars, people who are um, writing good things, uh, analyzing. It just doesn't look so great as uh, watching Tom Cruise in action because the work at issue is sitting behind a computer and uh, thinking hard about relevant questions and giving good answers and good reasoning to them. But the people who are trying to derail the, the train, you know, I already said, are also uh, some 
or people uh, like us and, and, and people in government, um, obviously, uh, but that shows that there is maybe a good ending to all of this. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. So um, thanks to everyone for keeping to time. So we've got about 15 minutes uh, for questions from the floor, if anyone has anything they'd like to ask. Do we have someone that has a microphone or do you want me to? Great, okay. Um, if, if one were to, uh, if to add, you had the authority to revise Article 21, um, how would you do so? Because I see Article 21 as a balance where one can invoke national security, but that is, then there's no, no right to compensation or rebalancing and so forth. And so there is, should be some sort of line, it seems, so you can't just declare national security for anything without rebalancing concessions. Um, so where in today's climate, which is different than 1947, do you think we, what should be added to Article 21 if one actually believed that there's a role for rules and a role for some sort of line between when you can declare national security and not in the other and the affected countries cannot raise uh, uh, equivalent withdrawal equivalent concessions. Why don't we collect a couple of questions? There was another one. Uh, thank you so much. You've mentioned non-violation complaints as one of the possible outcomes for Article 21. And we have PCS Bestus case where it was provided that if there is exception which is provided for in the agreement, most likely it will not fit to non-violation as everybody knew that it is in the agreement and that it can be possibly used. So I'm wondering how it can, it can be reconciled. Thank you. Let's take one more. Thank you, uh, Jonathan Bonnicher. Um, the question, I hope it's not too off piste it relates to the investment law aspect of the panel title um, and thinking about the way in the past that US foreign investors have taken different positions on the meaning and interpretation of security exceptions to the US government position. Um, the questions for Henry, thinking about cases like Huawei against Sweden and other ISDS cases that might be brought in the future with a similar fact pattern. Do you think Chinese foreign investors in those cases might uh, be taking very different conceptions of the interpretation of national security exceptions in those cases? And if so, how is the Chinese state likely to react to that? Great, thank you. Maybe um, why don't we start with Henry because we've been a little short on the investment piece of this title. We'll start with that one. Thank you. So I will answer the question that was addressed to me and also Greg's question. So uh, the Huawei question, well, uh, ironically, you know, Huawei uh, is in such a difficult position largely because of China's own making, because there's this provision in the national security law of China, which basically says uh, every uh, Chinese national and the Chinese firm has the obligation to assist the national security authorities on national security issues. So that is what brought Huawei into trouble. So I, I, I don't think uh, they would, uh, you know, uh, really make this a big deal because if they do, you know, then uh, this uh, whole provision would become the center of the uh, controversy. So that is what China doesn't want to see. Now quickly to Greg's question, how do we revise Article 22? I would suggest that we uh, use something like uh, the current UN Security Council arrangement, 
So uh, if this is uh, a security issue concerning one of the uh, you know five big players, uh, you know maybe five, maybe six, depending on uh, how you formulate this, then it will be non justiciable. But if it's other members, then it would be justiciable. I know that people might raise uh, you know uh, MFN uh, you know concerns and so on, but this is the reality. If it's the U.S., China, EU, you know, or maybe Japan. Uh, uh, reason this issue, so then uh, honestly, you cannot do anything about it. The national security provisions, uh, I mean, especially with the absence of the petty body now, uh, is only supposed to discipline the smaller players like Singapore, you know. Uh, but of course, Singapore is friendly with everyone, so we don't have a problem. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, two, two, two quick things. Um, first, uh, on, on the investment. Well, just bear in mind that not all of bilateral investment treaties have a security exception. So as it happened with uh, some Argentinian cases on a state of necessity, which will be an international law theory of why would they be entitled to do it? So just that point. Uh, and I will tie the two questions on, on Greg and, and the question of non-violation. Non, non, non because I think if you want to rethink about modifying 21 and reinventing 21, you have to look at 20, you have to look at the whole structure of the agreement. I don't think there is a quick fix on 21, unless you have a discussion on the rules, because there could be an issue of whether all these 20 cases now, whether we need to start thinking about whether 20 is, is more like, should be looked at as an exception. So to me, 21 needs to be tied up with, and, and it's the sequence, 23, 20, 20, 21, 22, and 23. You have to have a discussion at least of all those provisions in order to be holistic. You love the word. Three, three points. Um, Greg, there, there are other models out there. The United States and trade agreements has what I call uh, truncated security exceptions, or that's basically the 21B chapeau without one, two, three. That gives more leeway because it removes those conditions. Uh, it still leaves the question of what truly is a security or an essential security interest. There in the EU trade agreements, the EU treaty itself, there is a stricter uh, model, which is one for the uh, third exception, war or emergency amounting to a threat of war. It's only those things that is narrower, even under the highest threshold ever argued under the emergency in international relations. Threat of war, you know, is probably a notch even higher than the highest uh, argued and certainly higher than a sound threshold under uh, emergency. I would not rewrite in either of these directions I don't think we have so far identified a true problem with the existing security exceptions. Uh, on the contrary, we have discovered a lot of wisdom in them and discover more wisdom as we go uh, along. I would not stop this, but I'll admit I have started to deal with the WTO and WTO law at the moment of the Seattle Ministerial Conference. Uh, so I, in general, don't believe in the possibility of reopening uh, the, the gut that has been tried the last time in the Uruguay round. It has been done successfully on substantive gut rules the last time in 1955. I think it was called the second gut review. Um, Non-violation, excellent question. Um, yes, these, these are the parameters. Uh, here I can say not only I, but also the EU uh, doesn't believe in non-violation. Uh, playing a role there. Uh, in general, this is a very good basic principle that the invocation of exception comes for free. You're allowed to do that, restrict trade in these circumstances, and you don't have to give full equivalent commercial payment uh, for doing that, because that's what the idea of non-violation is. The US has a different uh, view. It believes in non-violation. It has announced in January a a proposal uh, on that, an authoritative interpretation. Uh, we haven't seen anything uh, so far, um, and we don't know exactly what uh, is uh, con con contemplated there. An easy, rapid access, one without the requirements 
because arguably you would today not be able to win a non-violation case in a successful uh, situation of successful invocation of uh, 21. Uh, so the, the requirements, the time having to litigate, and the thirdly, uh, we just don't believe in the whole idea that I even find it ludicrous that imagine Iran was a WTO member, and then we would say we're not uh, we're not exporting plutonium to you. Uh, no, twenty one B one, and then Iran says, okay, full commercial payment. So what's the value of the plutonium we want to buy in your country? Uh, High number, yeah, I guess. Weapons are very expensive. You know that from the reporting on the on the war, how much even a single rocket uh, costs. For that amount of money, we block your car imports now. Yeah, uh, retaliation, which is uh, allowed under Article 21, and contrary to what extremely few people uh, think, the DSU is, is clear to the uh, country. So exceptions come for free. But I would, uh, last point, uh, recommend to young scholars a very fascinating subject of inquiry is exceptions for free. Non-violation is there somewhere, but probably for other um, things, where there is already the idea of maintaining reciprocity of full equivalent payment through uh, retaliation. Um, and for things where you can't invoke an exception, well, then that is the answer because we have the reciprocity and equivalence also elsewhere in the withdrawal of concessions. And for certain things, if you say, I have made a commitment, I have opened up this uh, sector or removed my import duties, um, and the other party has paid commercially in concessions equivalently for this in the negotiated deal. And then if I turn around and say, now I don't want to give you market access anymore, because it's you, yeah? It's not because of health and essential security, and just because I just don't want to anymore. Well, then you have to withdraw your commitment and that will have to be done on the full equivalent. Just a couple of thoughts. Um, obviously, Greg, uh, in your question, um, I am advocating from refraining from, from revising uh, 21 and uh, refraining from uh, carrying out the sort of exception proliferation that uh, I think we might do. And I just, this gives me a moment, though, to just sort of say something about the USTR's reaction, uh, you know, the, the, the press statements that came out that I think um, troubled many people when uh, they did. Uh, but I, I don't think that should have been surprising. I'm not, maybe people weren't surprised. Some people seem surprised, but I'm not sure that there was anything to be surprised about because their their reaction I think was consistent with their leverage building approach that they've been using for the entirety of the administration uh, across administrations right and so because these outcomes are so clearly tied as, as Ricardo has made clear to substantive procedural reform the need for those things that that um, I think those are conversations that likely cannot advance until we have other actions but but nevertheless I, I, I just worth saying something about USTR's reaction on the 21 um, uh, cases now um, so again, my final point, I think, uh, Greg, is, is that we should think more about recalibrating or redesigning our sort of commerce first stance. This is something that Ben Heath and Julian Arado and I have, have written about um, that would move us away from having to, to in, invoke these exceptions uh, in, in, our, in our redesign, if it's possible, um, which I take, I take Ricardo's point that may not be. Now, to the extent it may not be, then maybe we'll look at other models and Henry threw out another model, but one we haven't talked about is the OECD code derogation clause, which some will be familiar with, but I think is an interesting model uh, to look at um, sort of in, al in alternative. Just while I have the um, mic for one last, I just want to comment on something Ricardo said earlier, if I may, which is, um, I think you made a really good point, Ricardo, about a lot of this is about executives trying to get things done and not having the domestic political capital or ability to do so. Uh, and so, so I think we don't spend enough time talking about that and how we're working within exceptional spaces domestically. Maybe it's obvious, but I, I think we should really call that out more and think about how we deal with that problem insofar as it then has an impact on our bigger international problem. Perfect. Thank you so much, everyone. Well, I think we've managed to finish up just in time to go to lunch. So thank you, everyone. And please join me in thanking our panel.